Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan from the, the right. And I'm David Jones, and he claims I'm from the left, so I'll, I'll take it. And it's our first show together this season, so <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, and maybe the last. Could be. <laughs> this week, our show is the state of the city of Houston. Uh, the city of Houston has gone through uh, the worst flood in American history, and it is recovering. There are other issues the city faces, and we have three distinguished guests who will give us keen insight on the challenges the city faces going forward. First, we have Chris Brown, who's city controller. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Tom McCaslin, who's director of housing and community development. And finally, city councilman Dave Martin. So welcome to all three of you. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, Houston has been getting, been, except for the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce view, uh, pretty bad rap as far as uh, low, uh, national columnists. The 60 Minutes did a hit uh, on uh, the way we've developed overdeveloped and uh, I found this quote by uh, and I'd like for you to react to it see if you think it's accurate Larry McMurtry who wrote four novels about Houston um, said Houston is the kind of boom city that will endorse about any amount of municipal vulgarity so long as it has a chance of making money here it is customary to build in order to steal anybody want to embrace Mr. McMurtry's observation well, I think that's aggressive uh, uh, quote, but you know, obviously, Houston is the largest major metropolitan city without any type of zoning. Uh, we have enjoyed a laissez-faire type uh, structure, uh, and I think Harvey and a lot of these natural disasters that we've experienced recently—the Memorial Day flood, the Tax Day flood—it's uh, sending us a clear message that we need to start looking uh, more closely and rethinking how we have development patterns in Houston because uh, we're seeing you know hundred-year floods every year now, and I think. Uh, part of that is changes in obviously the natural environment, but other parts of that is uh, possibly the way that we've developed and or lack of resources for infrastructure. So a lot of complex things at play there. Dave, isn't that really part of just the Houston has grown a lot? I mean, it's done well. It is, but we, we do need to look at development a little bit differently today than we did pre-Harvey. So the area I represent and live in is Kingwood. It was developed in the 70s. But yet a lot of the protocols and procedures, the reason why we got flooded is because of release of the water from the San, Jac San Jacinto River and the Lake Houston flow down river from us. Um, and one of the things that we need to look at is protocols and procedures because when they would develop, they would develop before Kingwood was even built. When it was King's Ranch, nothing but forest and trees. So uh, the San Jacinto River Authority who made that decision on that infamous day during Harvey we need to look at development in Montgomery County, not only in Harris County, but all the surrounding areas. So you would say it's more of, it's a regional problem as opposed to like a city of Houston problem. It, it's absolutely a regional problem. The city of Houston's a big part of that region, so we need to be a leader in the space. But you know, again, as a city controller and someone that looks very closely uh, at the finances, we won't, we don't want to do something that's so restrictive that it work, you know, possibly to kill, especially after a storm of this magnitude. We sure don't want to do anything that's so restrictive that people start saying, well, we can't develop in Houston, we can't build in Houston anymore. There's a balance there, and we need to work to find that balance. And so, so to take that Larry McMurtry quote and turn it on its head, I think that it's true that if you can make the business argument for anything, Houstonians will buy into it. But you've got to make the business argument. We're at the point in history where we need to make the business argument for changing the way we develop the city. Maybe a higher density, uh, making sure that rather than the old slab and grade, we go back to an even older version of pier and beam so that we are redeveloping our city in a resilient fashion. But it's that business argument that we have to be making at this point. I, I would bet that since, uh, since Harvey hit that you all have had the opportunity to talk to lots of people. That's right. And uh, when you talk to them, uh, I'm also willing to bet there's only one issue, flood control. What are we gonna do to stop this from happening? So uh, as the comptroller, you're the one who, I guess, watches over the city's finances. Yeah. Uh, I wish they were better, but they're not. And, and the Chronicle yeah. recommended, uh, by the way, they recommended that you consider, that the city consider raising taxes and busting the revenue cap as part of the solution. Because guess what? The, the, the federal government is about to go $2 trillion more in debt if, the, if their plan goes through. We can't look for them to bail us out. We're going to have to have our own resources. Well, actually, it's, isn't it fair to say, Chris and Tom, that the fe and, and Dave, that the federal government has a significant responsibility here through the Corps of Engineers. A lot of the flooding that we suffered was because of the Corps of Engineers' release of water from two inadequate reservoirs that we have mm -hmm. that hadn't been cleaned out in years and were built in World War II. Am I missing something? No, and I, I would just say uh, when you talk about the finance and you talk about the magnitude of what we are experienced, what we experienced during Harvey, 
you know, that was a rain event. That was a, a flooding event. That wasn't a hurricane per se. You know, it was more akin to Tropical Storm Allison. If we had had a direct hit of a hurricane, Category 4, uh, right up into the ship channel, we would have seen a huge storm surge. None of the water would have been able to come out. The devastation would be much worse. So the big thing I think that everyone is discussing, and, and Gary, you're right, flooding is uh, post-Harvey the big issue. Uh, not only what do we do to prevent another Harvey, but what do we do to prevent a Category 4 or bigger direct hit into Houston? Because that's really the catastrophic scenario. And I know they've talked in the past about the coastal spine, the Ike Dyke. That's a project that needs to happen. The challenge for the city is, uh, you know, that's a project that costs upward of $12 billion. The city of Houston doesn't have the money, nor could we ever tax people, right. which I'm not supporting, but we would never even be able to generate that kind of money. So it is going to be dependent on uh, the federal government and getting the leaders mm -hmm. that we've elected in congressional Senate leaders to go out there and advocate for us to get some of this money so that we can start this project now, we can avoid a further disaster in the future. And Tom, as our housing guy in the city of Houston, uh, we see rents increasing, uh, units available declining, and we've got thousands of people who are depending upon federal payment uh, for their for their rents, which is going to run out. Are we going to be left with thousands of homeless people? We certainly hope not. And part there's we are working towards that solution, but we do have to be realistic that there are going to be waves and waves of potentially new homeless people that we have to be ready to be, have a plan in place. Uh, the immediate plan for the folks who are still in the shelters is being executed, and FEMA is stepping in to fund that. Uh, we're working with the Red Cross to make sure that as, P as the shelters wind down, people are not leaving the shelters to go back underneath the bridges. But we have uh, this, a, a similar responsibility when people are, when the, when the FEMA payments get shut off for the hotels, for the people who don't have alternative options, we have to make sure that those options are available, that we are not creating new homeless people as a result of the storm. Yeah. So I, I think you're right, the flooding issue is huge, but there's an equally important housing issue that was here before the storm. We had people in homes that were unlivable before the storm and are now even more unlivable, whether they be single family homes or apartments who haven't been maintained, that haven't been maintained properly. Yeah, so the housing piece of this is huge. We did have an apartment glut in the Houston area over the last couple of years because of overbuilding that I guess is now gone. At the, <laughs> at the high end level. So these, that was a luxury A apartment glut, but not particularly a glut at the, uh, the level that's affordable for the people who are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis in our city. Now, your inter interesting comment on the Corps of Engineers, as a native of New Orleans, I've been there many times to witness the $14 billion coastal levee protection system that they built for 500,000 people. And we'll have a system built with a lot less money if we approach it the right way. And we have 6.2 million people in the greater Houston area. So uh, along with all the different things that we need in and around the port of Houston, whether it's aviation fuel, jet fuel, car fuel, it would be not only an economic, but an environmental catastrophe if we don't move forward with the coastal spine. So are y'all working with uh, the county and the Harris County and the counties surrounding us and the state also to get them involved to help? Yeah, th there's been an ongoing discussion amongst all the different agencies and, and people from both sides of the aisle. I know this is a political show, but both sides are, are supportive of this because they know that, you know, the potential damage uh, is catastrophic. And again, you look at uh, you know the Port of Houston and us being a, such a large producer, being the energy capital of the world. I mean, if we took a direct hit, it would take offline a huge amount of resources, energy resources for the country. So you know that coupled with all the devastation and national headlines we've gotten from this Harvey storm, I think you know they say don't let a good crisis go to waste. This gives us a very good platform now to you know kind of accelerate that discussion and really hopefully get some money down here to start that project. So one of the things that you regularly hear from people who do flood work is that we cannot prevent flooding. And we are in a city where flooding is going, flooding of streets is, is going to happen. But I think that we've been way too accepting of the fact that every time we have a heavy rain, people die in the city, nearly every time. And not at the numbers that they died during Harvey. But when we get a heavy rain here, people either drive into uh, flooded areas or, or they get swept into flooded areas and they die. We should not be a city that's like that. I think as a city, we should at least adopt the modest commitment that we're going to have the flooding infrastructure necessary 
so that people don't die every time there's a heavy rain. Yeah, that sounds like an admirable idea. And those are billion dollar expenses. I can give you a solution right now that would help the residents on the northeast side in Kingwood, Atascocita, Huffman, and that is the level of water that is maintained in a water reservoir called Lake Conroe is at 201 feet above sea level. If you lower that to two or three feet, that gives us a cushion which would have been very good for us post Harvey because we wouldn't have flooded had they released water like the governor of Florida did before Maria came in. Had we had a San Jacinto River Authority that had protocols and procedures that allowed us to move water in a systematic approach from Conroe through the San Jacinto to Lake Houston, eventually to the Gulf of Mexico, we would have prevented every house from Kingwood from flooding. Now we have 5,000 houses we've lost and 62% of our businesses. So how are you gonna tell me uh, and direct those folks that they need to rebuild and they need to come back with their businesses when we can't assure them that this isn't gonna happen tomorrow? That's our biggest complaint. And what we can do today, governor of the state of Texas, is immediately release three feet of water out of Lake Conroe and give us that cushion that we need. One of the Not things that Chris, uh, the columnist Chris Tomlinson put on your plate was that we should use this as an opportunity to move people from who are lower income people uh, using perhaps Section 8 uh, uh, vouchers into middle class neighborhoods and eliminate poverty and perhaps probably move us out of being the most uh, economically uh, segregated city in the country. I don't know if we can eliminate poverty as, as a result of this crisis, but we can eliminate well, no, the concentration said, of yeah, poverty. That's what, that's what I mean. And, and what's, what is completely um, incomprehensible to me is during the tax day flood, we had a, a 100 percent uh, federally funded low-income housing apartment complex that flooded with six feet of water. By mm -hmm. the time I came, became the director of the housing department, uh, that, depart that apartment complex was already mostly rehabbed and was in the process of moving people in. And during this tax day, uh, during this flood, that it flooded with between six and eight feet of water. So the maybe fact it's in the wrong place. It, and that we've, we've got to be making some hard decisions about whether or not some of these buildings are going to even be rehabbed, let alone bought out. And, right. and that's something that the city can control. We can ask the federal government to come in and do their job, and I think they should. But if we can stop them from rehabbing and putting these low-income individuals back into these apartments, we have to do it. The follow-up question is, and where are those apartments going to go? And are we, as a city, going to make sure that we're committed to doing mixed-income developments throughout our city? And uh, uh, Dave, I wonder if you, um, if we can move on to the other matter on that's actually on a ballot for people to vote on, which is the pension bond, the billion-dollar pension bond, which uh, I don't know whether you supported that at council or not. Yes, I did. Okay, and um, tell us what the likelihood it is of of passing, and secondly, you know, have the firefighters, you know, undermined the effort to passing that with the most recent contra temp with the mayor uh, snubbing him uh, while they're whining about how much equipment they don't have and how much okay. training they need. Well, David, that's actually factual that the fire department it is may under be. invested in by the but, city, but among the, other things. That, yes. that, that, that may be true, but, this, but the timing is, is well, suspect. Yeah. Well, I think Gary, um, Gary will probably disagree with, with me on this, but I think the pension obligation bonds have a good chance of passing. If it doesn't, then we're gonna have to slash and burn the general fund in fiscal year 2018 and a lot of those point back to privatization of certain departments within the city, one of which is the Houston Fire Department. And can you privatize EMS? Can they do it more efficiently and more economically than we do it ourselves? That has to be part of the equation. We need to make sure that we have the opportunity to do a bid. And if the fire department wants to be a bidder in the EMS services, move forward with it, David. But we need to look at a different model to run in city government. And that is we need to look at privatizing, privatizing certain departments within the city. And the controller can answer the question about whether or not if the, if the bond uh, fails, mm -hmm. that we will immediately have 155 million annual payments to our, uh, our pension obligation, and we'll lose 2,200 cops, firefighters, and civilian employees. That's just That's, is, that, is that accurate? Well, uh, that is accurate. Um, essentially what has happened with the pension uh, solution that was passed in Austin is it, it does um, many things, one of which it requires uh, going forward us to fully fund 
not only the fire, which as you all remember was through collective bargaining, we had to fully fund that actuarially required contribution yeah, every too year. Too bad we didn't do that for the others. <laughs> for the others, we, we deferred through meet and confer for police yeah, and municipal. We used the money, Chris, and this was not on your watch or any mm -hmm. of your watches, but be clear, that money was used to, to pay for spending yeah, and they you deferred the pension payments. So totally irresponsible. So, so to be clear, those pension payments, uh, and if you look at last fiscal year, we should have paid some $750 million. We frankly just didn't have that money in our general fund budget. So, you know, the option is, you know, raise taxes, but now we're on operating under a revenue cap. So we did, I think, and I say we, because you're right, it was before many of us were in office, Absolutely. but uh, the only thing they could do, which was to defer those payments, which is a very bad practice because you're borrowing that at 8.5% rate of return, which is, you know, very high. Yeah, you're um, not making that in investments. I you're not making that. that in investments. But but as part, going back to this uh, pension solution that was passed in Austin, uh, it now requires us to fully pay all three of those plans, albeit at a lower rate because we did get uh, $2.8 billion, in excess of $2.8 billion in reductions. So that lowers the annual payments. But what ends up happening is that uh, we're in a position where we will have to fully fund all those plans every single year. So if we lose this bond election, we will have to roll back $1.8 billion of that $2.8 billion in savings. So what does that do? That increases the costs annually that we'll have to pay. You got to make it up somewhere. So we can't defer anymore. That's a good thing. But we're also on the hook to fully pay this. So uh, 150 plus million next year. Actually, in this fiscal year, we'd have to pay another 26 million. So, you know, really the crux of this issue right now is, you know, we've been hit with this natural disaster and we're trying to bounce back from Harvey. So do we want to self-inflict a financial disaster by voting against these pension obligation well, bonds? Well, I think, I think, I think not. Yeah, well, Chris, with all due respect, I think the simple answer is the, the, the city has already inflicted this on itself by the irresponsible leadership that preceded you three gentlemen in He office. just cannot wait to kick and, Lee Brown. Go ahead, bring yeah, up Lee uh, Brown. No, but I'm going to talk about what the problem is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did a little calculations that. today before I came, and it found we have a double A plus rating, the average rate that we'd have to pay for bonds if they issue in the next week or two, 3.05% for 30 years. For the bonds we're issuing, 1.495 million. The amortization is 76 million a year. Question for all of you is, and I couldn't find the answer, where's the money to pay that? Bottom line is last spring we were down 112 million. We had to do smoke and mirrors to balance the budget. So we have a budget crisis regardless of what happens because of the irresponsible and then what you all inherited. It's a train wreck. The truth is, all these pensions are never getting paid. You have not, you have not told the truth to the people, but the money's not going to be there. You would have to double or triple property taxes to dig out of the hole that this city has dug itself into. Again, none of your gentlemen's fault. We cannot do it. So the problem with the deal is it's not good enough. So what we have to do, and the voters should do, is vote no and let, empower the city to go back to the unions and say, look, we can't pass this with the taxpayers. You got to give us a deal we can sell. Just like the Toyota Center deal was sold the second time to taxpayers because the deal got better for the city and the city smartly took advantage of that opportunity with the defeat to drive a harder bargain. And that's what you're going to have to do because the other thing that troubles me, and I think we have a card on this, but I'll show you. The mayor says, quote, uh, it's going to improve improvement bonds. None of the propositions are going to carry a tax increase. That is not true because you can't pay for it without a tax increase. And in fact, the language on Prop A that you all have read says, it also says, and the levying of taxes sufficient for the payment of thereof and interest thereon. So taxes are going up. The mayor's plan, if you'd be honest with the voters, is we need the money and we're going to come back to you and bust the spending cap because we need to raise taxes so we can pay these bills. And here's the problem. I'm not done. Here's the problem. That's a lot. You know, it's going to take a lot to re respond to that. I so. understand, but there's one other big problem. Sure. What was the number one issue we talked about when the show started? Flood, Flood control. Right. $1.495 billion, the largest bond issue in the city of Houston history, and that's how much Nothing. we're doing for flood control. Right. Nothing. That's why you need to go back to the drawing board. And that had been smart. If you had been smart enough to put $100 million in for flood control, then you could be able to tell voters, well, yeah, and we've got money for flood control, too. Now, I understand. Well, they None of you are responsible. They should have anticipated Harvey. No, they should have anticipated yeah. flood control, Dave. <laughs> so, 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 let, yeah. let me just start by sure, saying, go ahead. first of all... <laughs> now I got that off my chest. <laughs> first of all, there is money from, coming from our department. I, our department is not funded by the general fund, except for less than... Less Thank than goodness. 
very, very little of it. I think we've got $500,000 coming from the general fund. Everything else comes from grant funds. But we just sent, um, as a result of money coming in from the federal government, nearly $65 million for flood projects. Um, part of that is going towards bar buyout, part of that is improvement. So if there's nearly your $100 million right there in terms of work, and there's more to come as a result of the funding that's coming from both the 2016 floods and, and the flooding from Harvey. So to say that there's nothing coming, the well, question is, the mm -hmm. um, is, is there is money out there. Yeah, but that's, well, that's, that's, that's chicken feed. Because if, if the cost of current projects that we need in the region is like over a billion dollars. And the total cost of the projects we need in the region, Ike Dyke and all the rest, right. 20 billion. It's going to have to come from the federal government. It's going to have to state, come from state. the state. It's going to have to, you know, the You can the do all you want with parks. Yeah. You can build community centers. But if they flood, what good do they do you? So the number one thing we need to look at is flood mitigation. What do we do today to make sure we don't have this event happen again? And then I still think the pension obligation bonds are a good thing, but you look at the other ones that you refer to that talk about flood uh, community centers and parks and things like that. Maybe we need to re-examine that and put our money where it's most important, and that is in flooding issues right now. For the folks that live on the northeast side in Kingwood and the area I represent, we don't care about the parks and community centers because they're going to flood. If you mitigate the damage and you get projects put in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again, then somewhere down the road you can build your parks and your community centers and the other things that you need. But number one needs to be flooding, number two needs to be flooding, and number three needs to be flooding. Uh, Chris, there's well, a whole lot of money. Let's go back to the pension gonna... obligation okay. bonds because uh, I think there are some important points there that were glossed okay. over. You know, first and foremost, uh, you know, just to simplify it, people say, what's the first thing you do when you find yourself in a hole? You stop digging. We did some analysis around the pension fund. Uh, every day we were incurring over a million dollars in additional unfunded liability. So, you know, the mayor, uh, I give credit, he rolled up his sleeves, went to Austin, got a plan, passed through the legislature. Now, you know, this is something that was very difficult to do. Other mayors, you know, several, at, at almost every session they had tried to pass stuff, didn't even get out of committee. So this not only got out of committee, got bipartisan support, got passed. Uh, what did we do? We agree, We basically got mutual agreement, although firefighters would argue that in the end, uh, to $2.8 billion in concessions from uh, pensions and the unions. Uh, that was mutually agreed upon. In order to do that, we had to pay back this money that we had borrowed over the last uh, 16 years. Uh, I will agree with you uh, on the point of in 2001, the changes they made to the pensions. That basically put us on a course for disaster. It took a fully funded pension plan. Fast forward to 2017, we had an $8 billion unfunded liability. We were at a very precarious time in the city of Houston, and I coined many articles, uh, one in the Chronicle, about the point of no return. We couldn't continue to add to that unfunded liability because at some point the problem gets so big that no one's going to agree mutually to make cuts, and then you're not going to get anything passed. So uh, bottom line is we ended up uh, getting this plan. The pension obligation bonds are a part of it. The plan will pay down this debt over 30 years. We have to fully pay, number one. We move to a closed loop 30 year amortization schedule. What does that mean? Pension obligation debt, they would amortize and roll it every year. So it's like having an interest only mortgage. You, you never pay it off. We've right. changed that. We've moved to a closed loop system. Well, that's where the number I came with came from. We've that been able to essentially, knock on wood, we get these pension obliga obligation bonds voted on. We'll cut the problem in half from $8 billion to $4 billion. We'll pay the rest over 30 years. And we have a risk corridor that protects us if for some reason the plan doesn't uh, go as, as we devised it. Uh, there are uh, basically stop gaps in place to make sure that we auto-correct so we don't go another 16 years. Oh, have a, we only have a minute. I want to give it to Dave Martin. All right. uh, are you satisfied with the police chief's reaction to Senate Bill 4, where he seems to be taking in a position that he's not going to be in agreement with the Fifth Circuit ruling even? <laughs> Uh, he even said, I'm, I'm gonna, I have 302 homicides. I'm not going to go arrest some day laborer at, at Home Depot. I, I think the police chief needs to abide by what the federal government told him to do. It's pretty simple with me. If the federal government tells you what to do, you enforce the federal government's roles and responsibilities and rules. So I, I think he's totally off base. And uh, that was just a Fifth Circuit opinion, so he's, it's not over with yet. But right. It's still coming. Thank you for being here, Dave Martin. Thank you, David. What about the other two? <laughs> you can thank them. All right, Chris Brown, <laughs> Tom McCaslin, thank you so much. I did want to say briefly, 
uh, oh. your your audit committee that's looking over the money coming into the city on on flooding money is is a good thing. Chris is doing good Thank work. Thank you and catch us next time on Red, White and Blue.